Jamie, I'm so glad you're here again. First of all, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. This is, you know, the umpteenth time you've been here on the podcast. And like I was telling you before I hit record, um, I'm just excited today because in many ways, I feel like this is sort of your flagship message. Um, so I'd love to actually just start here. What's the backstory on the new book? I mean, all these conversations we've had, all these people that you've coached and helped domestically and overseas, there's a backstory on this book and I want to hear about it. Yeah, well, the, the, the book was interesting because it was it was one of the first times in the U.S. that um, we we got were invited to speak to a, a couple hundred, 300 men wow. for one day, just for one day. And um, and uh, so it was a challenge and, you know, people just invited whoever. And so we come into this room on a Saturday morning just we were just going to go from eight to like five straight through the day and just see if we could with with that many men in one room just walk through fear shame mm -hmm. false identity true identity hearing from god all with a group that you know you don't really know yeah and um so it was it, it was a little bit intimidating because you don't know how something like that's going to go but but just to see what the Lord would do in, in it with that many people in one room. And that was, as you're saying, that was the culmination of a lot of years of working in, you know, Muslim culture and Hindu culture and all kinds of mm -hmm. culture to see if there's just basic fears and lies that people um, are entangled in that are just common to humanity. Mm -hmm. And and if there are, then then we can then we can talk pretty openly and pretty forthrightly to to really anyone knowing that the Lord will speak to them and, mm -hmm. and that the Lord will move them in a way that we wouldn't be able to do if we were just, you know, preaching a sermon or doing a lecture. So that's really what happened. And, and then um, so s someone heard that podcast of that recording and said that, you know, this ought to be this ought to be something written. So then it, it turned into this journey into this book. So, wow. Yeah. So that was the first time I'd ever done that many folks in one place just doing that. Oh, it's so incredible. Just going back into your story a little bit. And I, I know this personally, but as many times as you've been here on the podcast, I'd love for uh, everyone hanging out with us to hear the same. What was the moment for you, Jamie, that the inflection moment when you sort of said, wow, I didn't know this was possible to live fearless in my true identity um yeah i mean i think there were there were like two two real moments of revelation like that um you know because as they say information doesn't transform revelation transforms it's really just a, an experiential encounter with god but once was was when i was a police officer and you know, work in a case, an abduction case, and just being really emotional about it. And I was 20, 25 years old and asking the Lord, can, you know, is, does he speak at a level or communicate on a level that would help us locate a missing kid? And, um, and, and telling the father of the kid that had been abduct, abducted that we were going to find his kid, which is, you know, against the procedure of any good police department to make a statement like that. And my partner really reprimanded me for doing that and said, why did you say that? And I just, I said, I don't know. I felt like it was the right thing to say. But then we split up and I got in my car and I just asked the Lord, do you do this? Can you do this? Do you do this? How would I know that you do this kind of thing? And then having this car pass me on this residential street, just driving 25 miles an hour and feeling like someone hit me, punched me in the stomach or sick to my stomach like something really bad had happened and just, and then looking that car was right there in proximity to me and I pulled it over and the kid was in the trunk of that car. And so that was one moment where it was like, there is a level of knowing and experiencing God that is um, human. It's, it's part of human and God relationship. It wasn't, you know, celebrity. It was just this, very deep, beautiful knowing and God communicating and really over a, a, an issue of justice and injustice. That was one. And then 
years later in working in Indonesia, working among Muslim population, and um, the guy who was mentoring me, and it takes mentoring for sure, watching me and saying to me, um, in a way, you know, you, you you can hear from God. I mean, you're good at that. It seems like that. You understand that, but you don't know who you are. And it was like another missing element. Like, okay, so I can hear from God, but not all the time and not really well. And why not? And I said, you know, I do know who I am. And he said, no, you don't because you're imitating me. And hmm. I realized uh, imitating other people isn't what your goal is. So why, if you can hear from God, why would you be imitating other people or trying or measuring yourself against other people instead of pursuing your own identity in relation to the Lord? And so when I, when those guys walk me through this kind of understanding your unique identity in the kingdom beyond you're a child of God and all these beautiful things, but my unique identity, then I realized this kind of groundbreaking truth that God, when he speaks or when he leads, will only speak to the true me. He won't speak to the imposter me, the shadow me, the, the me I'm inventing to be like other people or to make other people like me. So that was a big one too. God will speak to the true me. And then looking back in the scripture and watching Jesus really mm -hmm. refuse mm -hmm. to speak to the, our false presentations of ourselves. And even to the point where he'll, he said in, he said, to, many of you will do these amazing things in my name, you know, cast out demons and, you know, heal the sick. But I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And he's talking in the section where he says a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Mm -hmm. And he's saying in the false identity, you're going to you may claim all kinds of things you did for me in the false. And I'm going to say, I never knew you. I never knew that fake you, which is a relief <laughs> to know. To know that he's saying, I don't want the false you. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I refuse to work with your invention of yourself or the world's invention. So a lot of freedom. in. It. Yeah, I suppose we're going to work our way inside this and then back outside of it. But Jamie, if many of us have been living inside a false identity for so long, that now oh, yeah. our true identities are indistinguishable from the false. How do we even recognize the false? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the great question. And um, we, we're so, we, we're raised in the lie, right? We're raised in the lie of self-protection and self-promotion, really based in the deeper lie that there's not enough in the world for everyone. And so Excuse you got to go, you get, right, yes, the scarcity yeah. mentality, and you got to get your peace. And if you don't get it, God's not going to give it to you. So it's really on you. So you, you grow up with this sense of everything in my life really depends on me at some level. Um, you know, am, am I going to be a good person? Am I going to be a real Christian? Like all this is dependent on my ability to produce. And, and you know, at any level of truth, you have to tell the truth. I'm not going to be able to produce at the level that I think I'm supposed to be. So you have this you begin with uh, everything depends on me and I'm not going to be enough to do it. I, there's not enough in the world and I'm certainly not going to be enough to be a great, a perfect parent or a perfect spouse or a perfect whatever witness for Jesus. And yeah, and so you do, you grow up inside this lie and then your value comes from your rate of production. So my only value in the world is what I can produce for God or other people. And if I can't produce enough, whatever that arbitrary number is, I'm not as valuable as someone who produces more than me. So it's like a no win. And all of us are in this illusion or delusion, and all of us feel the pressure of it and the lie of it deep down inside of us, and it creates conflict inside of us. And so either we just give up or we create these coping mechanisms, these false identities that are all built on self-protection and self-promotion. And it'll never change until you're until you start telling the truth. And I didn't know how to tell the truth until someone challenged me. So it's about community. It's about being with people who will call out the true. And they're not. It's not accusation or anything like that. It's just 
right. just tell the truth about what you really believe about yourself. What do you really believe about yourself? And don't be afraid to tell the truth. And most of us believe mm -hmm. that we're not good enough. That in, I mean, I, I, I've been doing this with groups even this morning, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter that they're Christian or non-Christian. When you get down to it, they believe that somehow God is distant in certain parts of their life and it's up to them to be to make things happen and they can't do it and it produces fear in them so yeah, yeah. it takes i think it takes community it takes a, another person who cares about you with no agenda to say yeah. to you hey we're just going to tell the truth about what we really believe about god what we really believe about ourselves and what we really believe about others let's truth tell let's confess and let's move from there asking god what he wants us to know about who we are and who he is and who others are. Does that open up a commentary on willpower then? In other words, when I'm trying to self-protect and self-promote, I am relying on my own strength. Do you have any thoughts about willpower, the limitation of willpower in, in the context of this conversation? Yeah, well, I've never been able to use willpower. I've never had willpower work for me. No, why not? Um, because, well, because I think the willpower is is also based in self protection and self promotion. It's yes, weird. Sir. It's like the willpower is sourced in the lie. And so again, if if I'm just going to will my way through things, it's interesting because when I when I talk to especially younger guys, and they're talking about yeah, we get up at seven in the morning and we work out, and they have these goal sheets and these, um, you know, then we had a quiet time and. And, you know, then we committed this amount of time to work. My question is, yeah, but who are you? Who are you? Like, who's, who's in the weight room? Is it the real you or the false you? Is it, are you, are you doing that because love is motivating you into that? Is it other focus? Which is a huge question. Is what I'm, is what I'm doing, is it other focused or is it self-focused? Is it for my benefit and my good? Um, and those are those are the truth telling questions we have to ask ourselves. So willpower for me is just I'm going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to do it, which is I already think I'm not enough. So how all of a sudden am I going to do it? <laughs> right. So I might be able to say I might be able to I might say, well, I can make myself stop drinking and I can make myself stop looking at pornography, but I can't make myself love myself. I can't make myself love others. I can't make myself love God. I need, I need the spirit of God at work in me to, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It's not my, it's, but Christ lives in me In the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. So it's, it's a shifting over to, um, I, I like when Paul says in Colossians, he says, I labor according to his power. I labor, so it's not you're off the hook, it's I labor according to his power which mightily works in me. I love that verse. So what I'm doing is aligning myself with the power of God that's at work in the true me. In the true me. So that means the journey is to really understand who does God say that I am? God, who do you say that I am? And then in in his identity for you, then what is what is God inviting the true you into? And wow, when you know that, you go into it with everything you have. Yeah, so it is making the it's really making the decision. Yeah, you said willpower is sourced in the lie. That is absolutely stunning. What's the lie then? Is the lie that I can do it myself? Yeah, well, I think it's even deeper than that. The lie is it's all on you. It's worse than I can do it myself. It's like if you don't do it, you're a failure. That's like, see, that's an identity statement. I am a failure. Um, so I love that. You know, it's just watch Jesus when he, when he, it's that beautiful passage when he does the catch a fish with Peter and Peter says to him, depart from me. <laughs> like, he, Jesus is inviting Peter into something and Peter's saying, I can't, not only I can't do it, he's saying, walk away from me, right? 
And then he says, why? He tells his identity to Jesus. I am, I am a sinful man. That's his identity. I am the one that will fall short. I am the one that will fail. I am the one that doesn't know who I am. I am that one. So to walk away from me as if Jesus is calling him in his willpower to follow Jesus. He's, you know, it's like, if you can do this, you can follow me. And then Peter is pretty much saying, I can't, so walk away. And, and Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. I love that answer. It's not like, oh, you're not sinful. You're a good guy. You're, he just says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what? Of the, of the false things that you believe about yourself. They're not true. And then he's, follow me and I will make you to become. There it is. Follow me. I'm inviting you and I will make you to become fishers of men. Um, not follow me and do the best you can. Try the, as hard as you can. Set good goals and objectives. Follow me and I will make you to become. <clears throat> and so then what you're doing is fixing your eyes on Jesus, which is the discipline. Fixing my eyes on Jesus, who is the author. He's the one that wrote this thing. And the finisher and the perfecter of my faith. He's the, both the beginning and the end of it. So the goal isn't how hard can I try, it's how much can I abide in him. Which is a will, is a decision. I will abide, I will abide, and then I labor according to his power. Right, I, I'm, I'm going to stay attached to the vine, but the vine is what feeds me. So it's, so it's an invitation, and it's what we're doing is accepting the invitation to participate in what God is inviting us into, but not making it happen. That is such a paradigm shift, Jamie. And you, you said here, it's how hard I try versus how will I abide. I want to I go right there because if we're building this house – called Living Fearless in Our True Identities today, Jamie. I want to start with this foundation, which is abiding. You talked about it in your brand new book, Living Fearless. You said that right. a person doesn't learn to abide. A person abides and then learns what happens as a result of abiding. So, so let's yes. start there. What does it mean to abide and what yeah. does abiding require? Yeah. And so, I, you know, that's what it that's what I how I started the, the book in the beginning when I'm talking about my field training officer who was in the police department, who was a very hard guy to be with, very, very difficult guy to be with, but he was a great trainer, discipler. And, um, and so I had to abide with him. It was something he said to me about it, about abiding, because it was a Catholic prayer. His mom used to pray, actually. But, and he was a sort of a wayward, bitter Catholic person. But... Um, but so to, he would ask me, are you going to remain with me? Are you going to stay with me in what I'm saying to you? And he would tell me that he's, that he didn't, he would say to me, I don't think you're going to make it. I don't think you're going to make it. So why don't you just stop coming to work? And it, it was an offer to like, not abide with him, not to remain with him. And so, so I didn't learn to abide with him. I made the decision to that every day I was going to go abide with him for 10 hours, no matter what happened. That's it. That's right. And then in the abiding with him is where I learned everything from him. <laughs> so it's like saying to Jesus, I'm, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to accept the invitation no matter what happens, because if I don't accept the invitation, I'll never learn anything from you. Right. So, yeah. So in the abiding is where we learn. I know people studying what it means to abide. Abide means be with them, be with, be with. And that and then in the in the being with. And then so abiding with my FTO for a year, day in and day out, I, I started to become a good police officer by being with him. Not by laying in bed going, boy, I wish I was a good police officer or reading books about being a good police officer. I had to get out there every yeah. day with him in the real life experiences asking me, are you afraid right now? Why are you afraid? Are you are you going to take money from that person? Um, yeah. Are you going to go off with that prostitute? Like in real life scenario, him challenging me and asking me whether I was afraid or not. 
that is so much what the Lord's doing with us, you know, every day. It's just walking with us, Emmanuel, God is with us, and challenging us. What do you believe about yourself right now? What do you believe about me right yeah. now? And then correcting it, like my FTO at the end of every shift would go through a critique. Say, oh. here's what you were wrong about. Here's the way you need to think about it. Do you want to keep going? <laughs> and all I had to say was yes or oh. no. <laughs> Well, I'm building this case intentionally in this conversation. So I, I suppose I want to go here next. Why is it so dangerous to live without a sense of identity then? I, I mean, simply because you'll, you'll just self-destruct because mm -hmm. you, 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 you'll mm -hmm. isolate yourself and humans were made to be in relation. Humans were made to be in relationship and the worst thing you can do as a human is to isolate. I mean, we see what happens when kids isolate. They come out with guns and shoot other kids. It's because they, they alienate and isolate f for lots of different reasons. And it, it, it fractures the human spirit. It damages it. So to not abide is to, is to be on my own. And I form wrong views of God, myself, and others. Others become my enemy that I've never even met. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, so that's the danger of, you know, that sense of, it's not being alone, it's being isolated, it's being alienated. That's, those mm -hmm. are the words that are, that are um, harmful for humans. So to abide prevents mm -hmm. that from happening, protects us from that. Isolation breeds separateness. Separateness cuts us off from the life source who is Christ himself, right? Amen. And other people, right? And others. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. Jamie, uh, fear yeah. shuts down creativity and the reception of new ideas. Why? Yeah, again, because you, because you won't take a risk. You, you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of failure. And, and it's your identity. It like reaffirms my identity. If I try this, it probably won't work. It may, it may not work. And so I can't bear the, the affirmation of my own sense of rejection and failure. So I can't risk anything. Hmm. And fear comes from the... If I gain, if I if I'm going to gain my identity from the success or failure of something, because the praises and the curses of men destroy us. Either one can destroy the human. Yeah. yeah. Because they both are perhaps false. But so if I'm a, if I'm going to gain my identity from some endeavor, and and I think, wow, it may not work, then I then fear prevents me from try even trying. Mm. And I, 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 you know, it was interesting, like even today I was talking to this person, we were walking through this and, and it was a woman and she said, you know, there's a thing I would, I want to really go to God and ask God, you know, what's your will for me, but I'm afraid to ask. And I said, why? And she said, he might make me move. And I said, move like geographically. Yes. He might make me move away from my extended family. And, um, and that fear means that even when she asks God, what's your will, she doesn't mean it. She's not, the fear is preventing her from even saying the truth when she asks God a question, hmm. right? And so it's just so mm -hmm. debilitating. And I said to her, say, Lord, I want to do your will, but I'm afraid. That's a truth statement. Yeah. Help me with my fear. Walk me through my fear in order that I can ask you questions truthfully. Because mm -hmm. even in the question is self-protection. Truth-telling, confession, for seven years, for the seven years I've known you, I mean, this concept of truth-telling and confession never fails to blow my mind. We teach about what true confession is and what it's not. Yeah, so confession, you know, if you're raised like me, confession was always just saying you're sorry about everything. Just confess, yeah. confess your sins, say you're sorry. And th there's really, it doesn't really move anything forward to just say, I'm sorry about something. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, when I was a police officer it, and you're, you're asking a person to confess, you actually hand them a Miranda, sh you know, warning. They sign it and they say, okay, I want you to write your confession. And if all they wrote is, I'm sorry, 
50 times, nothing happens. There's no change. We don't know what the person did. We don't know where they were. So a confession is truth telling. Just tell the truth about what you believe, what you did. Just say the truth because the truth will always set you free. It'll always liberate. Mm -hmm. It'll always mm -hmm. move things forward. Fear is always trying to get things to stop, to end. Truth and joy move things forward. They move towards freedom. And so confession is truth telling. So, so God is inviting us to tell the truth. If we tell the truth about our separateness or our shortcomings, then he is faithful and just to cancel, to forgive, to cancel the negative effects of our separateness and cleanse us from everything that's not right. What a, what a beautiful invitation, 1 John 1, 9. But if, it's, if I say I'm sorry for my sins, he's faithful and just to say it's okay and cleanse me. Nothing's changed. It's like tell the truth about your separation. Your sh tell the truth. I'm afraid. You know, I, I don't believe these things about myself. So that's truth telling. And th what's interesting is when you do that in a group or with another person, most humans actually don't know how to tell the truth. It's not that they're liars. It's just they actually don't know what the truth is about themselves. So if I say tell the truth about themselves, they've been raised to self-protect and self-promote. So they'll just tell like, you know, they'll, they'll couch how they talk instead of saying, you know, I'm afraid of failure. Like that is beautiful confession. And we can work with that all day long. Um, but if you say, I'm, uh, you know, I'm shy, and I'm sorry that I'm a shy person. That just, it's all like meaningless. So, so truth telling is, yeah, to just really tell the truth. I'm, I'm afraid that God can't work in another country, so I can't go. That's confession, that God's local, right? Um, and so that's that kind of truth telling. Tell, just tell the truth. And then from the truth, we have the chance to change our mind about things. But we can't do it until we tell the truth. Mm. And behind that's fear, I think. You said moments ago, fear basically is designed to make things stop. What does that really right. mean? Unpack that a little bit more for me. Yeah, so, right. So it's interesting because so joy is the jet fuel of creativity, joy. Joy is, all, you know, wow. for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It's like joy mm -hmm. moves forward. It's joy is sourced in love, but joy is the thing that we feel. It's that thing that pushes us forward. And joy is my constant companion. Joy is my fear is like, how do we get out of this thing? How do we stop mm -hmm. this thing? How do we end this thing? And so it shuts down forward movement. It shuts down like, like when Jesus is praying, um, Father, if there's any other way to do this, he's like investigating options, but it won't shut it down. It's not like I'm not doing this. It's like, is there another way here? Not my will, but thy will be done. That's mm -hmm. joy set before him. That's moving towards, he knows there's something ahead that's hope, that has hope to it and redemption to it, even though mm -hmm. it's dark. Fear won't, fear won't see that. Fear is eyes down. Fear is like, how do, this hurts. I want to be done with it. There's too much risk involved. So it's hard to think of various options when you're afraid. It's just like, I want to mm -hmm. stop it. Mm -hmm. If we're going back to confession a little bit, I, I think this is such a linchpin principle for, for people to apprehend because, as you said in the book, it's the beginning of true transformation. What keeps us from really accessing and just looking at truth straight on? Is it fear, guilt, shame? Yeah. And like I we trick so. ourselves. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh, that, this is how deceptive, yeah, this is how deceptive we are. It's like, um, um, what ha you know, if, if there's some people group that I'm afraid of and we've built this whole case against them, whoever it is, I mean, we have documentation, all of it is so why we can stay separate from them. They are not my brother, as Cain would say of Abel. They are not my brother. And so I can dehumanize them and I can resist relationship with them. Well, truth would have to come in and say, well, you're afraid of them. But what are you afraid of? 
And, and what truth will always lead to is what you really believe about God. That's where it always ends up, right? And we don't want to say that God loves all people equally. So to, if, because if we get to that, then it means that this whole case we've built up is a straw man. You know, it's all invented. But it's, it's so like, again, back to the, today, I was taught, this person had said, I am afraid to be disconnected from my family. And I wrote that down. I am, listen to these statements. It's, they're, to, they're being statements. I am afraid to be the disconnected one. <laughs> That's what they're saying, but they don't know that. I'm afraid to be, I don't want to move away from my family because I don't want to be disconnected. That is not what you're really saying. That's, you know, I want to be close to my family, but that's, that would, that's fine. You want to be close to your family. But what if the Lord says, yeah, but if you love mother and father and sister and brother more than me, you cannot be my, my disciple. Like, let's put it in the proper place. So what does it mean when you say, tell the truth, I am afraid to be disconnected from my family? So I just kept asking her, what does this statement mean? Tell the truth about it. I can only be connected to a, a family if I'm next to them geographically. Is that true? Is that the only way to be connected? No. So that's not true. What about do I get my identity from my family? No. So disconnected from what? What are you disconnected from? It, it, it is because the person gets their sense of identity from the family. But so what does this sentence say about God? It says about God that if I move across the ocean, God is not able to maintain my connection with my family. There's, that he's only yeah. he can only maintain family connection if you all live right in the same neighborhood. So all of it ultimately gets back as to what do you really believe about God then? That God picks out certain people above others because he doesn't. And, and so you don't have a chance for real repentance or mind change until you tell the truth of like, wow, this is what I really believe. God shows favoritism to people. That's what I believe. And that's what Peter says when he has to go to Cornelius' house. He said, he confesses, I now know. God shows no favoritism because he didn't want to go into the house of a dirty Gentile, right? But he had, but God had to bring him to the place of where he would really say that. And it's quite a confession for Peter to make that statement. And he's saying, I now realize that is not true, that God is at work among Gentiles and Romans, sold, occupiers, and that they are calling out to the Lord and that the Lord does speak to them and hear them. So um, all, of that's, all of that can shatter your safe little world, your, your cozy little worldview. And God's very good at shattering those things. So, I, yeah, we need a lot more of that. <laughs> I'm just trying to thread this through for people because there is such an invitation to a journey in this. And I've got a statement I want to make about that in a moment. But um, what I surmise then is that the assignment and the MO of the enemy is to keep us in secrecy and shame where we're looking. I mean, you and Donna have taught me this for seven years, down and in instead of up, up and out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Yeah, well, and, and again, that's that's interesting um, in Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah is, has the vision of the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and he's looking up at God. He's looking up at the presence of God. Everything has to start with the presence of God. That's the beginning point of every way that we think. And he looks up at God, just like just like Peter looks at Jesus after the catch of fish. And Peter says the same thing that Isaiah says when he looks at God. Isaiah says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And then he makes a statement about the others. And I live among people of unclean lips. So he's saying, when I look up at God, then I tell the truth about what I really believe about myself, which is the way to freedom. When you're in the presence of God, God is like, say the truth about what you really believe about me and even other people. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. 
Now you have the chance for repentance, so for God to change that wrong view. If Isaiah, his greatest part of his identity is his mouth, is his ability to prophesy. And so the enemy works at like, whatever you do, remember this, your mouth is the worst part of you. It's the best part of him, <laughs> right? And so the enemy is at work at the very place where you're the greatest. And Paul says it, where I am weak is actually the place of strength. And where I think I'm strong is actually where I'm weak. And so it's that. And so by looking up to God or into the face of God, then we can tell the truth. We can speak truth. And God addresses the lie that I'm a man of unclean lips. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. These, these false statements, they sound kind of noble and humble. That's what's disgusting about them, is we glorify those statements like, oh, he's so humble. No, what he's saying is not true. It's like if I say, oh, I would love to go do that, but I'm a filthy rag. All my works are as filthy rags. I'm a worm. When you say that to God, he doesn't go, oh, you're so humble. And <laughs> right. No, what you believe about yourself is not true, and I did not say that about you. I did not say that about you. I do not accuse people like that. The accuser accuses. And then through an experiential encounter, they're able to see themselves truthfully as if God is saying to them, like, like when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. He's saying to the man with unclean lips and woe is me, depart from me, I never knew this view of yourself is not true. I don't want to ever talk to that view of that false you again. I want to talk to my mouthpiece to the nations. I want to talk to my fisher of men, the real, the real you, the one I knit together in your mother's womb, that one. And I want, I'm inviting that one to follow me. And then immediately, the true identity will turn outward. Who shall we send? Send me. The same guy with woe is me is now like, send me, I'll go. Because the true him wants to go. The true Peter is the rock. He's the, he's the lead guy. He's the one that will say, I'm willing to be crucified, but not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. That's the real Peter. Not this, oh, depart from me, for I'm a man. Not the denier. That's not the real Peter. The real He is, go feed my sheep. That's him. That's the real him. So, that yeah, in that, in that whole confession, truth-telling part is just the calling forth of the true you, the real you. It's, it's so remarkable. It's so like, you know, I've known you for some time, and the real you is still coming forward. Just like the real, I'm 62, the real me is still coming forward. And I have, to, I, and I keep getting to points where like, ah, there's no more left. That's it. Depart from me, Lord. This is, that's all. And he's like, you don't know. Stop mm -hmm. saying that. Stop mm -hmm. telling me who you are. Keep mm -hmm. asking me who you are. And I will amaze you with who you are. But only the true you can come with me. Only the true you can hear me. So abide. <laughs> I want to pop a balloon with you because this is sort of jumping out at me in my heart as you're speaking because, Jamie, I think one of the most common things I hear people quote in Christendom is, well, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord. And I'm like, hang on, wait a minute. You're pulling something way out of context. And that's like, here, I'll just joke around and make a silly statement. That's like saying, hey, Jamie, guess what? Chicken's disgusting. And I'm like, wait a minute, no. Here's the full contextual statement. When served medium rare and undercooked, comma, chicken's disgusting. But when yeah. marinated and grilled, it's brilliant. So here's Romans 3 in context. And Jamie, I feel like this could be a revelatory moment for people to step inside their true identities in Christ. So here it is. Yes, that's what Romans 3.23 says. But it is not the beginning of a sentence. Let's go back to 21. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, colon, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, comma, here it is, 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Jamie, what I hear you saying is 
Walking and living in our, in our true identities, fearless in our true identities, requires us to approach him in truth, to hear him thoroughly, and to not make up answers that are untrue to satisfy our own unbelief. Right. Absolutely. Or justify our fear, right? That's it. Justify our fear. And he's, he's yes, th- he's saying this has been done. This is, this is yours. You own forgiveness. You own redemption. You own it, the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So stop talking like you're not. Stop talking like something's wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Or that you're going to fail. I'm going to fail tomorrow. And like, stop talking as if that's true. It's not true. Yeah, I just, that's where, yeah, this is where I think Jesus is just like, how long do I have to be with you guys? You keep going back to zero. <laughs> like, like you keep going backwards on this. Yeah. Keep, keep moving forward in this, in the truth of who you really are and who I really mm-hmm. am. Yeah. It's so, it's so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. This whole thing called walking and living and receiving our true identities is an invitation to a relationship that is generative and maturing. Jamie, you talked about uh, living generatively in the book. I'd love to hear more about that because this is a key for our ability to hear the Lord clearly and then obey. Right. What it, it, well, I mean, it's just like any any human relationship. If you if you're like back to my like back to my field training officer every day with him, and this is two humans. Every day mm-hmm. was different in our relationship between me and him. And even though even though there was a vocational professional relationship, yeah, what, what was also happening was this very human thing between he and I because we became very very close friends um wow. even to when even to when i actually called him about this book did you really and asked him if it was okay for me to talk about him in the book and he was so moved by it and um and he said um is that do you think talking about me helps other people and i wow, said it does question. it really does and he that I, he said, I can't believe that I'm so grateful that anything I ever did would help another person. So imagine that's mine and his relationship. So I'm 62. I don't even know how old he is. Um, but so that relationship was generative. Every day was a different facet of that relationship mm-hmm. between me and him. And that was a tense one. And I was intimidated. Imagine an everyday re- conversational experiential relationship with God. Like how formulaic is that ever going to get? It's, it will not. And if it becomes formulaic, it's because we've withdrawn from it. That's the only way it can become formulaic is, is if we withdraw from the relationship and start just guessing what God might have said or would have done instead of asking him. Wow. Right? And so that's how I know when people are like, like you're not participating with Christ today because suddenly the thing has turned into this sort of formulaic kind of boring and you lose your joy. The joy goes away. Mm -hmm. So to get up in the morning and say, my commitment for the day is not, I'm going to share my faith with 50 people or all that, but Lord, I want to, I want to abide with you. And I want to, I want to know what you want me to know today and what you want me to do today. How could that ever turn into a formulaic relationship? It can't. Mm-hmm. And when and when any human relationship turns formulaic, there is no love involved in it. Mm-hmm. The love is gone. The joy is gone. You know, the magic is gone because it's turned into formula, and it's because the people involved are disengaging from the relationship. Mm. That's why abide is such a powerful idea. Don't live with another person. Abide with another person. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there, I'm working in a in a project with a guy who has a great vision, and he and he's in a really tough time with his vision. And I'm not doing anything with them except I said to him, "I will abide with you yep. in this. I will. I'm going to hang with you in this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do what you're in, 
but I will abide with you. And him and I abiding together has allowed him to see new ways of thinking about it. Not me, him. And so my abiding with him has given him life, right? Our friendship has given him life and it's caused him to abide in Christ. Hmm. So he, so that, that beautiful relationship is just someone knowing like, I'm going to walk with you in this and I'm not going to leave you. I don't know what to do, but I'm telling you, I'm not going to leave you. And so we have the God who will never leave us or forsake us. He's Emmanuel, the God with us. And so as long as we're committed to that listening, receiving from him, it's funny, we don't even have to do anything. We have to receive, we have to stay attached and receive from him. Well, oh my gosh, it's more than we can ask or imagine. So just stay attached, just stay connected to the Lord and, and receive everything that he has for you. Lord, what... What do you have for me today? I want to receive from you everything you have for me today. That's the prayer. It's just like drawing nutrients from that, from the vine. His promise is that he will never leave us or forsake us, but our perception sometimes is that he does. So we think like he does, we act like he does. And right, that absolutely. leads us right down the path of self-protection, self-promotion, right? I'm just trying to draw a circle absolutely. around this for everyone to say, okay, listen, we have to confront the fact that many of us are seeing things not as they are, but as we are. So absolutely. That's right. Yeah. And the way we view ourselves is the way we view everything else, everything else, even God, right? Uh, someone said, someone said, your economy reflects your, your identity, <laughs> And so if the economy is, you know, all about scarcity and self-interest and self-promotion, that's because that's what we already believe about ourselves, right? That we're alone. We got to fight for ourselves. We got to protect ourselves. But yeah, that's, that's really true. We don't have the mind of Christ in that. We, it, it's like that idea. It's like the lie that, well, if God was with you, things would look like this. You know, if God was with you, it would all look like you'd be successful or whatever. And so if that's not happening, instead of asking the Lord, what do you want me to know about this? Here's what I believe, telling the truth. Here's what I believe that is if, if you're with me, my relationships would look like this and they don't. Yeah. That makes me believe that you're not with me. That's confession. That's it right there. Tell me how to understand this. Tell me what you want me to know about this because it sure looks like you're not here. I don't know how many times I say that to the Lord. I feel like you're, I've said it a little bit, I feel like you're unable or unwilling to help me. Both are terrifying. You're either unable, which is terrifying, or unwilling, which might be more terrifying. But that's, mm -hmm. once we start to believe those lies, mm -hmm. then we start to drift, we start, we'll start to separate. Well, if you're not going to help me, and we, and we start to move. And I'm telling you, those are, it happens in little things. And so we're taking every thought captive. We're holding every That's thought. It. And the way to That's know so is good. you lose your joy. That's the way. You lose your joy. You can feel it in your body. Wow. I'm Suddenly I'm really anxious about this. I'm really terrified about this. What, one, time, one time recently I was getting ready to speak. I was walking on to – I was waiting for the song to finish so I could walk out onto the stage. And I became super anxious. I don't know why. And I, and I was like having heart palpitations. This was probably three months ago, not long ago. And um, one, of the, one of the girls on our staff was standing back there with me. And I, I looked at her and, and the Lord said to me, ask her to help you. She's just standing there. She's one of the st stage crew staff people. And the Lord said, ask her for help. And so I looked at her and I said, hey, I'm really, I'm really, I don't know why I'm super anxious right now. Kit, would you just lay your hands on me and pray for me? And it, and it, it, it she told me later it intimidated her, <laughs> but she did. And as soon as she put her hand on me, I felt calm. And so who did the Lord do that for? Me? Yes. Her? Yes. All of us? Yes. And she, I, 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 she was with us today, and she said to me, that time you did that to me really moved me to see that, um, that I'm part of something important and that I was able to help you. And, you know, that's because she's a younger, younger person. Um, 
and I, I just love that kind of thing. It's like what I could have gone out there, you know, with a lot of self will, but I would have missed the community and beauty of whatever the Lord was doing there. So mm. it's, it's just that truth. Don't, don't, don't try and willpower it. Just say, Lord, what do you, why am I afraid right now? I am afraid right now. What do you want me to know about it? And the Lord does these beautiful mm. little things that we would miss. Yes. If we're not asking him and paying attention to our emotions Jamie, you said something quickly, and that was around joy. We lose our joy. And I want to just follow that up to say to people today that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when your joy is gone, what's soon after to go away? Your strength, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And when I'm, it's interesting because when when you think about that verse, it's like, when I feel like intimidated or weak or like I don't have a lot of energy, that's the mm-hmm. verse I say. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What gives me strength? Not like power, joy. Yeah. Yep. Joy is what gives us strength to do all kinds of amazing things. Joy, joy in writing a book, joy in, you know, anything, joy in relationships. Like, Lord, fill me with your joy. Mm. Joy is the expression of love, I think, because love is hard to love is hard to like what does love feel like love is joy it's peace it's patience it's kindness like those are all expressions of love and the outward expressions where people can see it how do how how does god demonstrate his love toward us he died for us he he sacrificed on our behalf and i I don't know i don't think i say this in the book but it's interesting when you're when you i you know i have two daughters three daughters-in-law and two of them are from arab backgrounds and one's American. And if I asked her, my American daughter-in-law, how do you know my son loves you? She'll say, because he tells me. He says it all the time. If you ask the Arab, the Easterner, how how do you know my son loves you? She holds out the gold bracelet that he gave her and she just shakes it. She doesn't say any words. She just shakes the gold on her wrist. It's like, this is how, this is the demonstration. And so if someone says, how do you know Jesus loves you? We point to the cross. Like, that's it's by an act. It's demonstrated to me. How do you know he's joyful about you? We point to the cross. How do we know he's long-suffering, patient, good, kind, faithful? We good point man. to the cross. And so when someone says, how do, how do you know that Jamie loves you? They should be able to point to something that shows love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, sacrifice, those man. real demonstrations of the abstract of love. Well, he says it. Big deal. No, he demonstrated. And we love God because he first loved us. How do you know he loved us? He demonstrated his love. While we were his enemies, he was sacrificing on our behalf. Why? For the joy of it. For the joy of, of how, when he looks at you, what he sees. So, yeah, that joy is a powerful, powerful motivator. And it's it's not it's not like happy. It's not like this. It's, it's very like a, it's like a, just a steady, beautiful, yeah, I just have the joy. I just have the joy of the Lord. I just have it. So, I feel like the Lord is is saying right now to all of our friends hanging out with us, Jamie, come out of come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. Come out of hiding. Come out of hiding, and receive your true identity. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's so like let's you know it's like just saying to people like. I, I like let's write a book together. Let's start a movement together. Let's um, let's you know st- our, our community group's going to start a little business. Let's start a business together, like in community, yeah. even two of us. Mm-hmm. Like let's do something together. Let's be together, and it produces joy. And yeah. so, m- men love darkness more than light. Why? Because the darkness they feel like protected in the dark, but you're not. You're dying. In- Come into the light. Don't be afraid of the light. So and good. Come into the light and discover who you are. And like, let's do something together. Let's be together. It's, it's, joy moves things forward. Joy moves things forward. Fear shuts things down. Just what's stopping me from doing whatever it is that's in my heart? And, you know, I, th- I forget yeah. who said, wrote it. Said that Jesus was calling the disciples into who they long to be themselves if they would have known what to say. Right? What do you, what is it that God's He's calling us into be who we ourselves long to be? 
We can't do it in the dark. We can't do it with willpower. We can't do it alone. We can't do it in the false. We can do it abiding in him, and we can do it in community. Nothing can stop us if we'll do it that way. That makes me joyful just thinking about it. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's, it's really remarkable, Jamie. And, and what's so cool to me is you're living this out, and you're such a powerful example to me and, and uh, so many others, too, and your brand-new book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lies of the World for the Liberating Truth of God is available right now everywhere books are sold. Guys, go get a copy. Jamie, we've been waiting for this. I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful. Thanks. Again, this is uh, we broke our record, by the way. You're on the show once a year. 2022, it's twice a year because – in yeah, January, I right. said, so, Jamie, your your book's coming out. We gotta we gotta Ooh. talk about the book. So I'm so Thank thankful you. for you. I would love to just uh, just land our conversation here, and it's something I love to ask you to do. Will you just pray for all my friends hanging out with us? Maybe yeah. some listening prayer, and let's just go after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that, Lord. Thank you, thank you for the folks that are listening. Thank you for Chris, Lord. Thank you even for the, the the girl that was with me on the stage and the ones I'm talking about. I just bless them. Thank, thank you, Lord, for these amazing people. Lord, I pray right now. I, I, I pray right now for every person who's listening, who is lost in the false. And they know it. They can. We can feel it. Humans know when we're operating in the false because it produces conflict inside of us. It produces fear, guilt, and shame. So, Lord, I, I pray for those people, Lord, that right now, the fullness of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would be able to just speak truth, just tell the truth. I'm afraid, Lord, I'm alone. I'm afraid. I feel disconnected. I feel like you're not with me, that they'll just be able to move into truth telling. And, Lord, then that, that they would give that lie to you they would give the hand the lie to Jesus. And the, and, the, and the Lord, that they would ask you what you say. What do you call them? What do you say about them? The truth about who they are. And Lord, that you would call them forward in the truth of their identity. And that they could hear you and that they would get connected with you, Lord. That they would face you and be connected with you, turn toward you. You've always been with them. But Lord, that they would turn towards you and that they would get connected in a community that's healthy and that loves them. And Lord, that you would walk them forward in this beautiful adventure that you call life. It's about being alive and free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So Lord, I just pray for each one out there that you would reinvigorate them, that you would remember them. They've been dismembered by the world, that you would remember them and they would remember who they really are and that they would walk in joy, fearless, upright in their true identity. And we thank you, Jesus, that this is what you're all about. Faithful is he who calls us, who also will do it. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. You're a hero. I'm so thankful, Jamie. Anything else you want to share today or leave with the listeners? I'm so, I'm so thankful. Wow, yeah, just call out to the Lord. Just tell the truth to the Come Lord. On. Yeah, Stay come the on. Truth. Listen, As, listen to what he says. That's right. As always, Jamie, I'd love for people to stay connected to you and Donna. Tell people where to find you. Yeah, identityexchange.com is yep. our website. And um, yeah, you can get the book there or Baker Books. Yeah. So yeah. thanks Thank for you. being here. Thanks for having me.